With the recent arrival of the Adobe Premiere Pro CC 2019 April update, it feels like there's no end in sight for the long-awaited compatibility with Blackmagic RAW. But there is a third-party plugin by a company called Autochroma that really does work. The aim of this video is to simply build off of the already excellent video that the manufacturer, developer of BRAW Studio posted to YouTube. I've given you that link um, via this video, but it's a great place to start because it focuses in particular on the installation, which I won't get into as much here. And installation, in fact, includes adding a license key. But in the caption of that video, best to watch first, there is a link that takes you to the place where you can actually get the software itself. And the site itself is called AE Scripts and AE Plugins, aescripts.com. It reminds me a lot of uh, WordPress communities where um, you can purchase um, third-party developer plugins for the software. Here, um, it's called AE, implying uh, After Effects, but in reality, a lot of After Effects plugins are also compatible simultaneously with Premiere Pro, and that's certainly the case here. Indeed, it's really ultimately designed for Premiere Pro, as you see, platform. And the reason you have choices between one or both, Premiere Pro and Media Encoder, is because at the moment at least, the way the developer has designed the software is that you have to have one license key for each if you want to use both. So you could just get the Premiere Pro uh, license and then um, you would have to export from within Premiere and render out within Premiere and basically lock up the program. If you do want to be, have the capability to hand it off to Media Encoder, then you would tick this box to um, purchase both at the same time. Good news is, though, you can click this Try button, and you'll see it pops up with a box that gives you a hyperlink to download the executable package file. And that installer will install a trial that lets you import up to 500 frames, which is plenty for you to do a full run with full functionality to try all the different features and see whether it suits your needs and confirm that it works. Um, but um, bad news for you Mac users, there is no prognosis yet on whether this developer will develop a Mac version of BRAW Studio. At this time, it's Windows only. I personally am pro Windows because I can get a more powerful machine out of it, um, but uh, one hopes that it will also become available for um, Apple OS, and there's no reason why it won't be. Um, it's just a matter of time before the developer is able to do so. So heading back to uh, the clip, um, you'll see how they begin it with their sample clips. I live here in Washington, D.C., and so I've shot some of my own clips using Blackmagic RAW. I've used the mode that's called level five of some sorts. Uh, I forget exactly the nomenclature, but it's sort of a middle ground between um, the extreme ends. But let's first take a look at the actual file directory I'll be pulling these files from. These I pulled off of the SSD that I have mounted on my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K camera. Um, I'm not an Ursa, Ursa Mini Pro user, um, but the same format of Blackmagic RAW. And I don't have any sidecar files um, in this directory, just the BRAW files. But we'll get into that later and what that means. But um, I'm really going from the bottom up in terms of starting from the, from the, the rudiments. So um, I won't be working with sidecar files, but I may be creating some later. And we'll see how that works. I do have here in the mix, though, one .mov file, and you can see the clue here that, it, that Windows at least knows some of the metadata from that file and even gives it a little thumbnail preview. So it knows the UHD resolution, but it doesn't know that for the BRAW file. So that tells you that Windows doesn't yet, of course, natively support Blackmagic RAW. No surprise there. Um, another interesting clue is that, um, or at least something to look at, is the fact that the file size you'll see is considerably bigger. This one sample shot with this pretty much the same setup as an adjacent one is shot in ProRes HQ422. And um, in that file format at UHD resolution, 30 frames per second, you see the file size is significantly larger. These are all about 30 second clips. So this is one of the great features of Blackmagic RAW that you might get better quality with dramatically smaller file sizes. Let's see how that works. So going back into Premiere, um, I've got a pretty default workspace here in the editing workspace layout. And um, the nice thing about this compared to other workflows like Photoshop is that there isn't some sort of separate pre-interface of pre-screening and pre-setting 
things at the ingest stage. You just actually treat it like any old file. Once you have installed um, Blackmagic Raw as a plugin, um, and we're assuming right now I already have, which I have. I haven't walked you through that whole you know, Windows X installation process. It is installed. Um, then Premiere will not, if you will, freak out at the ingesting of these files. So I'm going to select all of them and say Open. And you'll see that it pulls them in. And it even can see visually what they look like now because um, Blackmagic Raw has been installed. If it hadn't been installed, even though the um, original manufacturer video goes into it much better than I will here, um, just so you know, when you do double click on any of the imported files for the first time, you want to go to Effect Controls. And then um, in this um, Master Effect Controls tab, there is a Settings and License button at the top. And then here you'll see I've already entered my license key. But if you hadn't yet, you just paste it in here and click Activate License. If you want to uninstall to reinstall into another license, since it does ping the internet, then you can deactivate on one installation, use your same key, and then install at another installation and activate. So, But I already sort of got ahead of myself here. If I stay back down here, you'll see that um, Hover Scrub works. So it really is understanding the clip already. But what you will notice, first of all, is that these do surely look a little flat, right? I'm going to go tilde out to full screen and really go bigger. And you'll see that um, it has that flat color space look. What else do we notice? Well, it's very indoor color temperature, isn't it? But remember the whole thing about Blackmagic Raw is that Blackmagic Raw, it sort of, in theory, doesn't matter in several categories how you shot it. That's one of the reasons we like to use RAW. So color temperature can always be adjusted in post-production when you're dealing with RAW files. Things like ISO are similar in that way. Um, let me make these smaller again. So as to this first one, yeah, I double-clicked it, and then it got me to the program, I'm sorry, to the source monitor, and then I could look at the footage and see what I've got. But really where things are going to start happening is when I go to the Effects Controls tab, Effect Controls tab, and then... Um, this is an area, it's funny, I teach editing at university and, um, and institutional levels, um, like nonprofits, and one of the themes uh, that I always sort of emphasize is that Adobe might tell you, the tutorials might tell you, that you can sort of start to do editing on things at the source clip level before you've brought them over here into the timeline. Um, I've always discouraged that and when it comes to the art of editing because of the fact that you sort of lock yourself into some choices that really um, cause you to go back and forth to the source and it's usually not a good practice here though is the one case not only because of the way that Autochroma has designed B Raw Studio but also because when it comes to dealing with raw footage and getting it at least ready for prime time um, and by prime time, I even mean the stage before you pull selects. You really need to get the um, original master master clip set correctly. And so it's a good practice in this limited circumstance to really go ahead, double click to open it up in the program monitor, go to effect controls and make sure that you're at the master tab. And when you're at the master tab, there's that settings and license button we tried earlier. The next thing that gives you access to customizing these settings is to basically depart from decode using camera metadata and to move into another drop down category that in this case is never going to be B raw default. What B raw default says is I will um, take it as it is. So it's kind of like it's saying, um, yes, I'll understand, um, I'll decode Blackmagic raw, but for the maximum control you're going to drop down to clip. When I drop down to clip, I can see it's interesting that it tells me in a ghosted out form, it confirms to me, in other words, that I am using version 4 color science. That was introduced sort of mid-2018, and um, that's good. That means it's the latest color science. It certainly is the color science that corresponded with the release of Blackmagic Raw altogether. Um, so we're good to go there. Uh, I think that, in a sense, that could be an uh, opportunity for future proofing if there are future um, color science upgrades to different later versions than 4. At this ingest phase, when we're trying to prepare our raw files for um, subsequent marking of in and out points, pulling selects, assembling into a timeline, 
we might do well to just go ahead and make a working timeline by just dragging the first one in to a blank timeline, letting it create a sequence. Already, I always tell my students, let's always make sure to name this because it always inherits the name from the clip that you started with, which can mislead after you start adding multiple clips. So we're saying for ingest only or something like that. That's what I've at least decided to do here. So now that I've got it in here, the whole point here is that over here, sure enough, in my program monitor, now I'm going to get a live view at a reasonable size of the things that I'm doing over here in Effect Controls Master. But now you can see we have this new tab here. Why? Because our time marker is over this part of the sequence where we would be able to normally add and modify our effects that by default always include a certain um, default categories like motion, volume, channel volume, panner, opacity, and so on, timer mapping. Um, that's in this tab that relates to the placement of the clip in the sequence. But we're in the master tab, right? So you'll see this information isn't in the sequence effect controls tab. We want, it in, we want to be in the master tab to keep tweaking this. The next category down is color space. And it's pretty important to kind of link it with another setting farther down the list and then distinguish them so that we always have in our minds what the difference is between those two. I know I was really confused at first and it took me a while. This is actually an area where this video fills in some of the gaps um, left a little unanswered by the Auto Chroma B Raw Studio video tutorial and also any of the PDF files that they provide with the package. So this is an important distinction. It might have been obvious to you in the way that you think about these things, but it at least wasn't the way I think about thought about these things until I really started um, getting acquainted with how these controls work. So Color Space has a drop down menu that lets you choose between Blackmagic Design and really most importantly the next thing down the list, Rec 709. And you'll see that when I finally select that, that we're going to get to white balance later, but at least now it looks, if you will, proper, right? It's been properly converted. So this takes just a moment of review, even though I know, especially if you're watching something like this and you know what Blackmagic Raw is, then surely you know what a LUT is. But I think it's important to kind of revisit what LUT stands for. It is an acronym. I forget often that it really stands for lookup table. And then lookup table in turn means that it is a strict mathematical formula that's meant to be obeyed is a good verb to use for it. It's meant to be obeyed so that the way the camera shot things to bring down the highlights to protect from clipping and then to raise the shadows to protect the details where it's dark is the whole point of that is to apply the exact same formula in reverse when you're starting to deal with the footage and pulling it off the camera. It squeezed it down to that flat color space in order to sort of save it in a way that wouldn't freak out the camera, that the camera sensor can deal with and so on. But there's no goofing around when it comes to LUTs. So that already sort of begs an interesting question. Why do we use the term LUTs for creative looks? So this takes us now to the workspace called color, and that brings up the Lumetri color panel. And this is a place where by now most Premiere editors at first kicking and screaming, but now sort of by default have to work in to do most of their color grading if they're not rendering out and then doing it in DaVinci Resolve. You know, this tutorial is about using B Raw Studio for Premiere. So I'm presuming that Premiere editors like to color grade inside of Premiere. And as that goes, Lumetri is now the only game in town for a lot of reasons. One of them is it is um, uh, hardware accelerated. So when I start making adjustments here, you know, I've got the effect applied to the sequence um, and it shows up in the effect controls panel when I click on the clip as it appears in the sequence. It's a hardware, hardware accelerated effect that leverages the use of my graphics processing unit, my NVIDIA or my AMD Radeon card. So it has that going for it. It also has going for it the fact that um, it can integrate with um, surface controls like my Tangent Ripple, which is basically three trackballs that I can use for um, a faster workflow in terms of controlling all these things. And then reason after reason after reason. So we all know then if we're familiar with Lumetri that there's this basic correction uh, category up here that is where we spend most of our time but there's also this creative category so kind of jumping ahead only to set ourselves up to go backwards 
there's this drop down that says look and then in there you see every once in a while even the suffix lut on some of these titles so the problem is is that lut is a term that's often used to describe things that apply creative looks that further change the final look of the image so it's been a running joke that for years Premiere has given us these just endless list of completely goofy, useless things like, I don't know, what's one of these? Amateur, sci-fi, low budget, cold, which ends up, I mean, my white balance is already off, but, you know, it makes it look utterly goofy. But some of these are a little more sophisticated. You know, Film Convert from New Zealand really nails it, but they've at least got a few film stocks like some Adobe and Fuji and Kodak. I'm sorry. Fuji and Kodak by Adobe, which is goofy itself. Um, but those are further tweaks on top of this. So I'm going to turn off the creative LUTs that I rarely use anyways. And we're really talking about input LUT. So what is input LUT in comparison to Rex, this color space option here? So if I set it to Blackmagic Design, it's got that flat look. And what this means is I'm leaving it without the LUT applied to convert it from the way I shot it, which is in Blackmagic film mode, not Rec. 709, but film mode. I'm leaving it that way for a downstream application of the lookup table using the input LUT dropdown under basic correction. So on the boot disk of my hard drive in my technical LUTs directory, I have pre-installed Whoops, got an auto save there. I have pre-installed the Blackmagic Pocket 4K film to video, the latest version for color space, installed. So what that means is that if I select that, it's applying that input LUT, and it has a certain proper converted look to the Rec. 709 video color space that we're working in and that we're likely to export into for uploading to... Uh, YouTube, Vimeo, and so on. Um, so the this is one way of doing things. And that's actually normally the way we do things when we have camera clips that we don't have this sort of raw um, metadata settings stage on the ingest side of things under the master tab. But under this workflow, since conversion according to the strict Oh, or I should have said obeying the strict lookup table is something that doesn't really deviate at all. There's no value to saving for later downstream an application of this um, Blackmagic official LUT in the basic correction category. So we say none here, and then we, um, we say none actually in the right place, which is that we have to go here and say none. Because when you are in the master tab, you can also accidentally, as I just did here, apply Lumetri color effects so that is downstream always. So um, here in this master tab, we set it to Rec. 709, and then it's the same as if, and actually better than, because uh, it's right at the source, than if we had gone and set it to Blackmagic Design and then applied the lookup table down here. Okay, so largely the same thing but more properly upstream so that it just flows down into every incidence of this clip in any sequence um, where it appears. So that's that. I'm going to jump down, just since we're on the same subject, to this gamma category. So what is that all about? So what this category is asking you to do, and I wish there were sort of a subtitle to really clue us into this um, distinction, the gamma dropdown asks us the question, how did you shoot it? So on the menus of our, in the example of the Blackmagic Pocket 4K, and also in the Ursa Mini Pro, you, of course, can choose what kind of colors, color space you acquire the footage in, and then how, and then you can choose between film mode, video mode, which is Rec. 709, um, which is not flat at all, and then Blackmagic Design Extended Video. So this is starting to look weird because of the fact that if I select something here that um, I didn't originally shoot it in, then my results are going to be crazy. I know for a fact that I shot the footage originally in Blackmagic Design Film, which is, by the way, as compared to video and extended video, the highest dynamic range and the best for color grading in terms of latitude 
in every category of saturation, um, luminance, chrominance, and so on. So gamma is what we do to select how we shot it. And then color space is what is our, it answers the question, well, what is the ultimate color space we're going to be working in and exporting to? And for 99% of us, it's Rec. 709. For those rare, rare people creating HDR content, you choose Rec. 2020. And then again, if for some reason you really had to use um, Save for Later, the conversion um, of the LUT, uh, uh, f then you would choose Color Space here and leave it in film log mode and then apply the LUT later on. I could see that, for example, if you're using the Film Convert, convert plugin um, and wanted to match between different camera profiles and that sort of thing. Makes sense in that case. But for most of us, we're going to go here, Rec. 709, and then down here at Gamma, again, chose how we shot it. Uh, if our camera metadata had given us all of that information, then we'd be good to go. But um, we are uh, deviating from the camera metadata and certainly from the, from the Blackmagic RAW defaults by, tr you know, customizing everything because it behooves us to do so. So Rec. 709 color space is what we're working in. Um, but we shot it in film log. So finally getting on to ISO. Um, if you know what Blackmagic RAW is, then you probably also know that one of the virtues of shooting in RAW besides higher fidelity in many categories is the fact that there are a lot of decisions that you can make in post-production without worrying about them in the field. And the top two of those categories are um, the next two things we're looking at in this list. In terms of ISO, as long as um, uh, things aren't radically blown out, it, that tests the limits of other um, sort of hardware and, and camera software categories, you really can choose your ISO after the fact and put it wherever you want. So in this case, I could see the wisdom maybe in tweaking up to 125. In other words, in hindsight, we're saying to ourselves, if I could make this decision again in the field, I would have chosen, you know, 200 ISO. So we're just basically eyeballing it, but we'll always be able to use the Lumetri controls over here to further tweak these things. And in general, I certainly find myself on a clip by clip basis, oftentimes bringing down the highlights and just making a lot of tailored decisions, depending on whether there's a lot of shade in the shot and so on. So speaking of shade, moving to the next category of well, actually, no, we're going to get get to the shade in a second, but we have to finish out on ISO and on a related topic of exposure. And this exposure um, control, which can be flown out into a slider, is an example of a kind of thing that you can do at this source ingest master clip control phase, but which for most of us is better saved for over here in the Lumetri color phase when we're applying Lumetri color onto the incidence of any clip in a sequence because on a case-by-case -case basis we might may have different reasons for adjusting it. and of course over the course of a shot especially over a long clip one section might have one exposure situation and another one might have a radically different one so we would tend to use um, Lumetri. We wouldn't want to create a situation where um, at the master level we're making these judgments about how to further refine these settings apart from the ISO. So these work hand in hand, but is there any wisdom to adjusting the exposure values here when we could do it downstream on a clip by clip basis? And the answer for most professional editors is kind of leave that out of this step. Um, but you see Autochroma forging ahead. It's kind of interesting. I've been in correspondence with the developers, and there's a healthy debate about whether um, it's in their best interest to keep beefing up the features offered um, by this um, interface. Uh, the more that they stack on these sorts of exposure controls, we're also going to see that down here with gamma controls. These typical kinds of things that we see over here in the Lumetri color panel, we see over here, right? Is there wisdom in giving us these controls? Probably not for most of us, but if you really wanted to you know, hone in up front, then you have this control here. So enough said on that, but they go together. 
but really focus on the ISO to get yourself into the ballpark, counting on the fact that downstream on a clip-by-clip -clip incidence basis in your sequence, you'll be able to further, further refine the um, luminance. By the way, always properly in separate categories um, of, of highlights, shadows, and midtones, right? Which is what ISO only approximates as a general matter. So um, highlight recovery is, an, is a box where when you check it, um, you can see here that it doesn't isn't visibly changing anything and that's because I properly exposed this shot um, with my zebras on to make sure that I wouldn't clip if you did have content that was clipping um, past let's say 100% not sure what the threshold would be for this then this can help you recover highlights if you check this box on but thankfully by default it's off because we assume that good cinematographers aren't blowing out highlights, and so no need to activate this sort of extra layer of recovery. But if you run into that, if you did shoot accidentally with your highlights blowing out, this is something that you should use to visually um, compare. The category of white balance connects back to that theme I mentioned about ISO, where ISO was a thing where um, uh, you can make decisions uh, after having shot things in the field, when you get back into the studio, you say, I wish I could have, right? So this I actually did on purpose. What I did here is I decided to sort of prove the benefits of RAW and to, you know, basically demonstrate a typical situation of fixing problems. I set the white balance incorrectly in the field on purpose to indoor color temperature. So my camera is acquiring this image with the preference for white balance that is indoors illuminated by incandescent light. But what um, uh, the actual conditions were, and what I should have said in my camera, was to set this to outdoor color temperature, which tends to be around 5600 Kelvin as opposed to, I'm, yeah, 5600 Kelvin instead of 3200 Kelvin. So um, after the fact, I can go ahead and choose daylight and lo and behold, we kind of got back. It's going to take a moment for our eyes to adjust. It always looks a little weird when you pop back and forth. So you have to kind of like, you know, drink a shot of whiskey or at least like, you know, um, I don't know, look away and look back. And now we're actually, believe it or not, in the correct color space. We could further refine that with these white balance controls because, you know, we all know that these are generalities. When we say daylight, the fact that we shot in daylight doesn't mean that the corresponding Kelvin value for daylight is always going to be 5,500 Kelvin or actually traditionally 5,600 Kelvin with the tint modifier down here always at 10. And you can see how when we run through defaults, if we were actually back to tungsten indoors, then 2,850 is what it says that is. I always think of uh, incandescent as 3,200, but that's what it wants. Maybe that's the characteristics of this camera sensor. But in any case, we always tweak from there. I go back, though, to the insight that there's no such thing as one size fits all color temperature for a, a series of shots. So in this scene, I'm pointing into um, a wide open skies without a lot of uh, shadow content. But if I were pointing into the, gre the, uh, uh, the grove of cherry trees and most cherry blossom trees and most of the content were in the shade, then maybe 5,500 Kelvin wouldn't work, even though I'm technically in, quote, daylight. So maybe I'd choose shade or whatever. The, the point I'm getting at here is that over the course of a shot, you um, will find that the target color temperature that you really want to have is going to vary by small increments. So back to the whole spirit of all this, the whole point here was to start off with some generalities at the master um, project panel source clip level before we pull our selects and we put them into our sequence, where then we'll start tweaking it further using our temperature and our tint sliders and so on in the Lumetri color panel. So the, the most you can do over here is sort of approximate it and so if you just select one of these general categories, and then if you feel the need to tweak, go ahead. But you're still going to have to use Lumetri. It doesn't exempt you, in other words, from using Lumetri if you're doing this right. So that's all about white balance. And we've already talked about gamma. We didn't expose these gamma controls for too long, but that was part of me sort of crowing about the fact that at this master clip phase, um, any further adjustment of all of these categories 
are accomplished over here in Lumetri Color on a clip-by-clip -clip basis in a more productive way according to the standard color correction workflow. So it's probably not in our best interest to spend a lot of time um, over here in the gamma controls. I was intrigued though by this box and so um, I don't really have the math on this and it really isn't explained to us by Autochroma. Um, maybe it is in the official um, API that Blackmagic released that I haven't certainly read or understood how to code, but this use black video black level uh, checkbox does result in something. So, you know, if we really zoom in on the program monitor, I have it off and I have it on, off and on. And sometimes, you know, you know it when you see it. So I just would say that every time I've left this on, I always found the results more pleasing um, because I always found that the shadows were raised a little bit too much um, whenever I did a straight LUT conversion from Blackmagic Film over to Rec. 709. So I really appreciate this use video black level. It isn't on by default, and therefore um, you would need to apply it to every uh, clip. But speaking of needing to apply it to every clip, we've arrived at the last setting. And what that is, is the ability to save sidecars and load sidecars um, that are things that exist alongside the files with all the same file name, but with a different suffix at the end. And I'll show you in the file system how this looks in a second. But currently, there's no sidecar. In fact, I will show you that. Hopefully, I never created one before. But if I go into my directory here, then when it comes to the file that I'm working on right now, um, there is this um, other sidecar file that's sort of like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. That is something that's storing um, data sort of on a temporary basis in a sense. That is another kind of sidecar file in terms of the studio workflow. But when it comes to the official sidecar format, there's none here yet. And what it would look like is we get the same prefix, but we get a suffix that says sidecar. That is not a um, Autochroma BRAW Studio file format at all. It's actually a Blackmagic invented um, file format, this whole, whole sidecar format. So if they don't come from the camera directory that you shot with, um, as was the case in this workflow we're seeing today here, you can make one as a matter of some convenience for any future work that you do on this, even if you're taking this file directory and moving to another computer with a new sequence and so on. Kind of cool. So what that means is basically all of this ingenious work that I've done here of carefully and meticulously setting all this stuff, especially if I you know, honed in further um, when it came to color temperature and exposure issues. All this stuff, basically can be saved by clicking Save Sidecar. So it doesn't look like anything happened. I kind of wish there was a visual confirm built into the plugin. But we can trust that something did happen. And by the way, if I press it again, it's not like it makes a second one, a second incidence of the sidecar. It just updates the sidecar. So let's go down into the actual directory. And now we will see a file that corresponds with that 043 file. And it says dot sidecar. So that is a Again, that's not a BRAW Studio format file. That's actually an official Blackmagic RAW sidecar file. That means that this file and this file together um, could be brought into, let's say, DaVinci Resolve. And DaVinci Resolve would honor, respect, and obey all the parameter settings in this sidecar file. So that's cool. So let me go back into Premiere. And then the lesson learned there is that if I got very experimental and I started saying, you know, I really wonder whether the exposure should have been a lot higher and I feel like it was in the shade and I feel like the contrast should go way up to here. And then I'm like, oh no, I'm really getting off the path. Like this is starting to look like 70s disco. So things are getting all messed up, right? Including stuff like that. So once I've made a lot of bad decisions, or in any case, I want to start over again, if I say load sidecar, 
it's kind of a wonky interface. It doesn't really confirm to you what that you did anything. And it certainly doesn't say, are you sure you want to load this? And I just want to make sure you understand this or whatever else. You just tap it once. And then what it is doing when you say load sidecar is it's saying, I'm looking right now for the corresponding dot sidecar file with this same prefix that had a dot braw file. And when I tap it, it brings it back, okay? So there's that. And, you know, you can predict that if I say si save sidecar, it didn't change the file. It kind of updated it with the exact same information. Now, if I did want to make a modification to this, so let's say I did say, well, I think I could decide that the ISO deserves to be just a little brighter, bright day. If I say save, save sidecar. Now, if I keep changing my mind, go back down there, nope, too dark. Again, my latest save is loaded when I say load sidecar. So that's how that works. So we've been through the example of one clip. I always find it useful, especially in educational situations. Um, not that this is actually a class or a classroom or something, but repetition helps, right? So, and, and a changed context helps. So um, among these lovely clips at Peak Bloom in Washington, DC, let's try another clip and then kind of move a little faster through all these choices and sort of dialogue through what we're doing. Um, and then we might pick up some new things along the way. So my first step, it turns out, um, even though I went slower and more methodically and a little out of order when I first walked through one example of this was, um, I would just start right away in terms of dragging a clip into like a forge ingest only sample sequence, um, or the sequence itself, if you really can keep track. Because again, I want to have a live view of everything that I'm going to do to the clip in my program monitor. So this is an unmodified uh, Blackmagic RAW clip that I tap once on here. But actually, the important thing is that I've tapped over here and loaded it by double clicking on it so that it's visible in the source monitor. And also, I go to effect controls and make sure that I'm in the master tab. But instead of pulling from camera metadata, I'm going to go to clip. And in this clip category, I'm going to say that my output color space is not to keep it in log format, but to do my conversion all the way early on here at the ingest stage in the master tab um, from the project panel itself so that every time this clip appears, it'll always have the correct color space. And I'm identifying that sure enough, I'm a normal person. My workspace is in Rec 709. And now it looks lovely and the sky is blue just as it looked on that beautiful day. My ISO by default um, appears to be 200. That might also be what the camera metadata communicated over to begin with. And it also looks like that sort of nails the correct exposure. So I'm just going to let it stay at 200. And then um, my exposure is a further tweaking of exposure that I'm choosing not to do at this stage because it's better saved for um, the Lumetri color application of separate highlights, shadows, and exposure, which is to say midtones that sort of luminance correction is something that we really need to do on a clip by clip basis that has a lot to do with what changed over the course of a long shot. Um, the shot that came before, the shot that came after, the context, everything else. So best save for later. So we're gonna skip a lot of things here. I didn't blow any highlights, I properly exposed. I didn't ever have zebras, so I don't need to even sample what that looks like. In this case, my white balance, I did choose the correct white balance in camera. So as shot is working out for me, um, if I needed to say daylight, what's kind of interesting here is that by forcing it to the daylight white balance, you'll see when I expose the controls that it shows 5,500. When I go to as shot, it says that when I shot it, it was at 4,000. So this feels a little weird to me. I might have in camera sort of done a, a white card um, uh, capture, but I also note that the tint value is set to 11 here. So it's suggesting a lot of things that I basically pulled custom white balance in camera when I was in the field. Um, should I rethink that? Well, a lot of it is a matter of eyeing it, but a lot of it is your faith in whether or not you captured correct white balance when you were in the field. But to revive the theme that I mentioned on the last clip, the whole point of RAW is the fact that it's fairly non-destructive and there's a lot of latitude to decide things about RAW clips um, once you get back to the studio, be raw studio after all, right? So as shot feels like it's nailing it for me here, 
I'll need more context later on to see how it looks in comparison to my other clips, depending on how the sun was and so on. And then I could further tweak the controls here. But as shot, if you do diligently shoot things as a camera person, you're always likely to um, sort of, uh, you, you usually can't go wrong if you just leave it on the as shot setting. So I didn't need to expose the white balance controls unless I needed to tweak that. And then finally, my original gamma that I shot in was Blackmagic Design Film. That's the way I shoot all of my content rather than extended video, which is sort of like a film light that's almost ready for um, prime time but needs a little tweaking. Uh, I'm sorry, that's extended video. And then video is when you don't need to do anything to it and it shoots it the way. It doesn't have to go through the LUT conversion. But I shot it in film. So this again asks the question, how did you shoot this? Did you shoot it in the film log mode in your menu settings on your camera? And then again, all these gamma controls um, are things that I can reproduce for the most part over here in the Lumetri control panel on a clip-by-clip -clip basis when it's more appropriate. I did mention maybe at the beginning of this, when I went into the directory, I showed you that there's a .mov file. And I think this is the one here. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this into my timeline. And and this the value of this is going to be to show you the difference um, between... Uh, raw footage and ProRes footage. So, and again, I didn't want to, it's like a cooking show, right? I didn't want to just like cook the entire recipe and then have it ready for you um, because David Letterman's segment's running short and we have to go to commercial kind of thing. We'll just go all the way through this process. And my goal here is going to be to show a side-by-side -side comparison of the raw version and the ProRes version of the same shot, same conditions, same camera settings. So here comes the raw version on a higher track. And then one way I like to do this that's easiest, instead of using like the compare feature that's built into the new Lumetri controls, I'm just going to go to effects and I'm going to look for the crop effect. And on the higher track, I'm dropping the crop effect down and I'm going to select a midpoint but I'm going to choose it so that it's sort of like in the between, like a pillar like that. So that means that if we have raw on the top, then if we turn it off temporarily, we can see that the top is on the right and the bottom track is on the left, right? And the bottom track on the left is ProRes, so we're going from, so to speak, worse to better over here. So um, first, let's do the proper conversions of these. And remember, the whole theme here is that when you're shooting in log, um, apart from anything else, it's not that just because, um, it's not that the only thing that needs this sort of ingest prep, prep work, uh, the only type of file that needs that is, is raw. You've always needed to do the same with ProRes. So starting with ProRes, actually, there's no um, raw interface offered to me when I'm in the master category. There would have been on this one, right? Here I do get, if I go to master, I have this interface under video effects. For this reason, by the way, to interject one thing, um, it's funny how I think a lot of people, including myself, are sort of furious and almost feel like, I don't know, Jesse Ventura, like filled with conspiracy theories about you know, nasty Adobe and why they're not doing uh, the the update to include Blackmagic RAW. It's the, was the number one and now is the number two requested uh, feature uh, to be added to Premiere. It was goofy. I think Linux, being, being converted over to Linux in one day's time, bumped it from the number one spot, which I find extremely suspicious. But anyways, be that as it may. Um, even if Adobe does add the capability to ingest raw natively into Premiere, it probably will be something like this anyways. The criticism for using this plugin as a sort of third-party solution that's not integral to the Adobe Premiere platform is that, you know, plugins are bad and we're all used to plugins causing crashes. I haven't experienced a crash that's identified as being caused. You can go to your error logs and see which plugin is ever causing a crash. And finally, after years of begging for it, Adobe even reports to you at what time code the crash happened so that you know, you know, what plugin is causing it and which incidents of the plugin. That's awesome. Um, plugins are bad, right? But 
plugins are especially bad when they sort of, um, you know, make you go through extra steps or don't feel like an integral part of the platform's workflow. But in reality, when you think about it, it's just like with Photoshop. Photoshop has its own raw ingest engine that comes up with a screen that asks you to do certain things before it even is eligible to be edited. So it's very likely that the final implementation of Premiere's Blackmagic raw compatibility, if they you know, stop being so chicken and finally admit that they're going to lose customers to DaVinci if they don't finally pony up, it'll probably be just as sophisticated as this, if not more. So um, there's really no big thing besides the rather, I would say, small expense of spending the 29 bucks um, or times two if you want it for Media Encoder that BRAW Studio is asking. Um, besides that relatively small investment com compared to how much the software costs, um, you know, all of Premiere monthly, it probably won't look that different. So that's kind of my little sidebar. Um, so sure enough, in this interface, when I'm tweaking my um, ProRes footage in the Lumetri color panel, we talked earlier about, about the fact that, you know, it's not like you are exempt from this um, prep stage. Um, just because you shot in non-RAW format, because you still have to go down to the clip and then go to Lumetri panel and then select the input LUT. And then I have in my technical directory on my boot drive, I already have pre-installed the Blackmagic Pocket 4K film to video version 4 color space. So when I select that, you can see that it's properly converted it. It's it's, it's used the official lookup table to unpack that into Rec. 709 color space, and it looks pretty ugly so far, right? It doesn't give us, you know, any of the exposure controls in the raw input stage, but that's okay. For example, we can't change the original ISO that the camera, so to speak, should have shot it in, but what we can do, and we can even go to the scopes for this, right? We can look at the fact that our highlights are just crazy out of control over here. So we can take our highlights and really pull them down. After a point, it could look a little gooey and gross, but you know we pull them down pretty substantially. Let's just yank them all the way down here. And then um, we might even think that the exposure is too high, or we, or we might not. But let's try, you know, we pull them up actually, because the pillars lost a bit when we pulled the highlights down so far. Or maybe actually we leave the exposure, and then we actually bring the shadows up some more so we're getting sort of in the zone there where it doesn't look so terrible i can always toggle this off and back on so that's pre-application of lut post application of lut the elephant in the room was the problem with this um pro res clip having the intentionally wrong white balance so how are the ways that we choose the correct white balance when we can't just tell a raw file I wish I would have shot it in the right white balance and then it usually fixes itself when we pick it such as daylight well here you know we do usually so the first thing I always try if you use the picker on white balance selector and you know that something is like authentically white and this totally isn't it's marble it's all over the place but you know sometimes it's worth a try so I tap that once and I say does that give me a meaningful starting point guess and the answer in this case is hell no so I might even just reset that and say, no, like, let's start over again. So I double click this and I double click this and I'm back. Right. So at this point, it's just eyeing it, isn't it? We try our very best to adjust the, the white balance to what we think it should have been. And I'm really not as good as some of my friends at the incredible art of it's kind of like um, people who have perfect pitch where they just know it. I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm probably failing badly and I know it should be higher but I feel like it's too much and I don't know. I'm getting there, right? Maybe it was too much. I don't know. But it's certainly better than it was because if I turn this off, you know, you can see the original white balance and we're trying to get closer. We can use the compare view later, but for now, I've done my best to at least try and approximate what I should have shot it as. In other words, fighting against the bad white balance in camera. Okay, so what's the holy grail? The holy grail is that the whole, one of the reasons we love RAW is because back over here at the ingest stage for this clip so that it applies to every incidence of this clip, here I go again with my go to clip, 
as shot, if I change it to daylight, then I'm really getting back in the zone. I think I was, yeah. I did intentionally shoot it, um, this one as well. I shot it with more or less indoor color temperature. So if it's as shot, it's looking way too blue. If I go ahead and select daylight, I'm kind of in the zone, right? But I have one more important thing to do. The second most important thing I, I do during this stage is to identify the color space I'm working in. And that color space is almost always Rec 709. And after having made that conversion, here's the point that I'm making is that um, besides the fundamental superiority of Blackmagic Raw in terms of all of these shadow details being slightly better, um, and that is independent, of course, of other parameters that we can't go back and reproduce in camera, right? But we can always assume that Blackmagic Raw does a marginally better job of, of retaining some of these shadow details. But in addition, the ability to just flip to a different white balance in raw footage like this is demonstrated here because I really struggled to get something that approximates correct white balance. But this sky here, I might have made it look better for this, but it suffered over here. Over here, I've got this nice, you know, clean palette, but I've also got some great color, you know, some great white balanced um, masonry work here too. So I can keep trying to tweak these. I could do other things like go into compare view, right? And then for this part, I could kind of move this in a little bit. Let's see, I would also want to turn off the crop. Right. So I could use this comparison view to try and get this clip. I would actually be reversed, wouldn't I? I would go over here and then I get this later to there. And then any changes I make would affect this. So clearly my highlights are really blown out badly here, whereas my shadows are sort of approximating what happened over there. And so I've already brought my highlights down quite a bit. And then my shadows suffer if I bring them down too far, but sure enough, I've done that. So it's just kind of a mess, isn't it? I could bring exposure further down, but I've got crazy white balance problems and so on. So I could spend a lot of time on this. I could also go ahead and just give this a shot. I could go to color wheels and match and try this so-called Adobe Sensei, no face detection, but try this apply match, see what happens. And that's the best Adobe could do. So you see the difference between these post-production decisions of repairing bad color and bad exposure in raw I, I get I end up with this compared to ending up with this crap, including this crazy sort of sky gradient that goes from a fairly rich, nearly accurate blue down to something that just simply is in inhuman, right? But not all is that well when it comes to um, black magic raw. So the last part of this video is really sort of a suffix after we've learned how to use black magic raw. And honestly, we've done a kind of, uh, proof of its capabilities. I think this was also designed to demonstrate that it really does work, um, that it's worth getting and that it is really serving, a, an actual, uh, plugging an actual hole to get us up and running in premiere with black magic raw footage. And thank God, right? Because black magic raw saves so much file space. It provides us with superior results to ProRes, even at the highest setting of ProRes HQ422. Um, and um, it does so um, with lower throughputs. And what that means is that in the most cases, we can use internal card media, even not the UHS-2 type SD cards, but also UHS-1 class 3 um, SD cards internally in camera can handle all of the raw modes up to the top one. So everything below the, the most extreme uh, Blackmagic raw capture is able to be captured on an extremely inexpensive internal SD card. So it's making a lot of us regret coming up with these radical rigging solutions to mount a solid state drive with the dangerous cable sort of hanging off the edge and we had to put cable clamps on and all this stuff. It's really reduced the need for an SSD drive um, because of the fact that Blackmagic Raw is so much more friendly to a wider variety of flash media. So 
with all that said, the way we're going to get down to the pixel peeping level to see how Blackmagic Raw performs in comparison to, say, the best ProRes mode, which is 422HQ, um, in the internal recording of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, um, the best way to do that is to have more of a level playing field. I always had the um, crop line uh, right down the middle where you have a radical change in the highlights and the shadows. So maybe what I should have done is kind of gone over here. And then maybe we'll set ourselves up for focusing in on this portion of the image. So when we do that, what we'll be looking for is something that has been sort of suppressed as a criticism of Blackmagic Raw that makes me a little troubled because um, I don't know why there was such a backlash against people pointing this out, but it seems like a real thing to me. And I'm not a lab person, but I do know and can confirm to you that while I didn't have my best glass on the Blackmagic 4K at this moment, because it was just, um, I think it was a, um, a Lumix Panasonic uh, 12 to 35 millimeter lens, which is quite decent but it's not my Leica, so it's okay, right? But I know that I pulled accurate focus because um, I started with the auto, and then I also punched in to my maximum magnification and really had my focus peaking on, and I, I got it. You know, it's far away enough where focus didn't ro couldn't have roamed that much. There wasn't much. Um, there's a lot of depth of field here. So focus is accurate. I can sort of certify that to you, um, and I want to make sure that I've got this clip ready in the basic correction category, I want to make sure that I got my exposure sort of in the same ballpark, and I feel like I'm almost there. Yeah. So here's my goal. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in quite a lot, and my maximum magnification is 400%. So the area that I want to focus in on is at that dividing line here. And when I go up to these details, the thesis is... The thesis is that the Blackmagic RAW format is, so, so to speak, a little softer. And so, God forbid, I will have set you up with the worst example, but we're going to hunt around for something that might demonstrate that. And I'm sort of dissatisfied by this example. It's not the best that's out there on the net. But um, as I'm hunting around... I guess I can sort of see it happening. The problem is that the lines of convergence make this stuff closer than that stuff, so it may not give you the best and clearest example. But here's the theory. Don't forget that we have ProRes 422HQ over here, and we have Blackmagic RAW over here. If the theory is that Blackmagic RAW softens the image a little bit, and that ProRes 422HQ on the same camera sensor is a little bit sharper. Um, I think you could argue that that's seen here, but we are not getting the best case study of that. Maybe another way to see that bearing out is in the marble lines. So... I could say that that's less sharp than that seam, which is, you know, by, by probably by physics identical. The problem with these comparisons is that light casts over any pixel <laughs> according to sun and angle and shade and freaking everything in infinitely different ways. So you really do have to kind of think about generalities, but I'm beginning to see it. I think that... It's, it's certainly an exposure issue when it comes to the balance between highlight shadows and midtones. When it comes to the question of how much of this marble detail am I seeing over here compared to over here, surely if I sort of like, you know, I'll use as a quick fix to reduce the contrast. You know, is it making this sort of look less detailed? Well, sort of, but... Um, I think it's an interesting theory that I will simply save for you to tee up and to keep exploring this this thesis that basically this line is a little sharper than that line. Um, I'm at 400%. I wish I could zoom in even more. Maybe there's a fancy way to do it that I'm not aware of. 
But um, it's something that I'll be keeping an eye on, and it's something that, uh, it's funny, it was discounted out of hand because the final analysis is for all the other reasons, Black Magic Raw is so much more worth it, even if we have to sacrifice a little tiny bit of sharpness when we're pixel peeping, and who does that? Maybe at worst, we might take a UHD image and then punch in, especially with a one camera interview to get our second angle or to get our second focal length. And when we're punching in, we don't want the sharpness to be suffering when we're punched into 200 or even 400%. So that's a real thing. But the final argument for Blackmagic Raw over ProRes, even if ProRes is sharper, is that you don't get the other problems of ProRes versus Raw. So let's I'll go back to zooming in to 400% and look at the sky. Um, and when we look at the sky in ProRes, it's a mess, isn't it? You see the, and granted, again, it's probably also symptomatic of the fact that if we raise the exposure on this, but yeah, no, I mean, it's really showing the issue. Let me even, to have an even playing field, let me increase the saturation artificially. So when you look at the banding and the pixelization over here in the ProRes footage, and compare that to the much cleaner footage that we got out of of, of our um, Blackmagic RAW. It's really substantial. So, um, the in other words, the virtues of shooting in Blackmagic RAW, even if it's softer, out overwhelm the alleged sharpness of shooting in ProRes because of all of these other benefits that have been demonstrated in this video. I don't know if these super long videos uh, are of any value to the average user, but I did find, with, especially with the menu guide, which you're welcome to visit, also linked to in this video, uh, long form videos have their place, and I do welcome any comments um, if there's any areas that I could either stand to learn more about how Blackmagic Raw works, how to tweak it better, and any corrections to the things I've made here that I'll offer in the caption for uh, as an update. Thanks for hanging with me, and uh, let's all together, though, give props to Autochroma for stepping up and filling this um, gap in the Premiere workflow for letting us use Blackmagic RAW and Premiere, but also hope that uh, we don't have a need for plugins anymore and hope that Adobe steps up and adds this to Premiere. But for now, we're good to go, and thanks for watching.